Hey, good morning, you guys. I'm so glad that you're joining us today. Um, welcome. I just wanted to remind you all that uh, just prepare your hearts uh, for worship this morning and um, remember that your offer to mailbox office, uh, post office box D right here in Cole Camp, Missouri, 65325. And uh, we're glad that you're joining with us this morning. I hope that you're blessed by the service and we look forward to uh, enjoying time together today. So um, it's, we're glad that you're here. God bless you today. single focused our wills to be submitted to yours help us to begin anew today with you thank you for fresh starts thank you for new mornings new mercy thank you for victories this week God thank you for trials this week that have pushed us and God I pray that they've pushed us to you and for those times that they've pushed us away from You, God, we're sorry. Thank You for Your forgiveness that's been there from the beginning. That allows us to come in humility and receive grace. Thank You that Your kindness draws us back to You, Lord. Thank You that You don't look at us in a way of anger or displeasure, but that of love and acceptance. 
we're your children and you love us dearly, God. You sent your son to show us how much you love. God, help that to be an inspiration for holy living. Help us now as we lift our voices that we would sing with all that we are. Lord, as your disciple John Wesley said it, he said that when you sing, if it's a cross for you, if it's difficult, then you you bear that cross with joy and sing with all that you are. So God, we sing with all that we are today. We give you glory. We give you praise. You're worthy. You deserve it. And we're honored to give it. Bless this service. Bless our time with you this morning. Make it holy in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we worship the Lord. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare your our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness, O oh Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord, your presence, Lord. Amen. Dug into the hymnal this week, and we're pulling out some oldies, but some goodies. So I hope that you can enjoy and enter into this. If you've never sung it before, you'll catch on quick. Hymns are beautiful in that way. There is a fountain filled with blood that flows from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains lose all 
that guilty stains lose all their guilty stains and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains the dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day and there may I, though vile as He, wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. And there may I, though vile as He, wash all my sins away. Dear dying Lamb, Thy precious blood shall never lose its power. Till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Ere since by faith I saw the stream thy flowing wounds supply. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. And shall be till I die. And shall be till I die. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. Lose all the guilty stains. Lose all the guilty stains. And sinners plunged beneath that flood Lose all their guilty stains Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your blood. Take time to be holy, speak oft with thy Lord. Abide in Him always, and feed on His Word. Make friends with God's children, help those who are weak. Forgetting in nothing His blessing to seek. Take time to be holy, the world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus, like Him thou shalt be. Thy friends in thy conduct, His likeness shall see. Take time to be holy, let Him be thy guide. 
and run not before him, whatever be tied, in joy and in sorrow still follow the Lord. And looking to Jesus, still trust in His Word. Take time to be holy, be calm in thy soul. Each thought and each motive beneath His control. Thus led by His Spirit to fountains of love, Thou soon shalt be fitted for service above. Amen. Be seated, please. All right. So as I mentioned before, we're going to get into being patient. But before we do, um, let's talk. See, we're already working on it. Um, let's talk about some prayer requests. How is your sister doing? Uh, she's better. She's getting better each day. Good. Good, good. We prayed for their sister-in-law last week. She had knee surgery, had some complications, but things are going better. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, Anybody else have some prayer requests they'd like to share tonight or this morning? <laughs> what, day, what time is it? <laughs> it's nine o'clock in the night somewhere. Um, we had good audio there. That's good. That's good. Audio technical check there. All right. Um, anybody? Yes. Okay. Routine? Is this a routine surgery or we don't really know the specifics? Okay. Okay, so Leslie, friend of theirs, is having surgery tomorrow. Larry, how are your eyeballs doing? Well, they're doing good. I wanted to thank everybody for their prayers. Uh, they're changing my medicine. And uh, I'm glad that they're doing well. And I hope that they get better soon. And I'm glad that they're doing well. And I'm glad that they're doing well. And I'm glad that you got to do it for another 40 minutes, so be patient. <laughs> Good. Good deal, good deal. Yes, Olivia. Yeah. Okay, that's right. We are uh, on our back-to-school week. Um, so we've got brand new college students. We've got uh, folks getting ready to start. Uh, are you a senior already this year or a junior, Wyatt? Yeah, junior. Man, look like a senior. That's, a, that's a, quite a powerful beard you have going on there. But, um, yes, we do. We've got kids getting ready to go back to school, and there's a lot of stuff going on. And I'm just going to call it stuff. But uh, please do pray. Pray for teachers and for the kids. School's not going to look the same this year. Um, our son is starting fifth grade, and that's normally a grade where you bounce back and forth between classes and start getting that routine down. But they're not doing that this year. Their teachers are coming to them. So that's a, that's a new thing. Hopefully that will uh, help. Um, but uh, we're just going to pray for our teachers, pray for our students. We're going to pray, continue to pray for our nation. Um, it is not well. Yes, Henry. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, let's not forget our bus drivers. They are the ones taking our kids to school. So. Um, yeah, yeah, we got a lot of parents homeschooling this year because of uh, the pandemic. 
So we're going to be extra prayers for mom and dad because they're seven to eight hours that they used to not have to worry about making sure their kids were doing what they needed to do, right? That was the teacher's job. So uh, they just added their, themselves a little extra time. So hopefully we get some parents in here. It'll be good for them this morning at 11. Uh, learn a little patience. But, uh, okay, anybody else? Yes, Anita. Okay. Okay. And what is her dad's name? Do you know? David. Okay. If you didn't hear that, um, Anita's friend Katie, her dad David, has been admitted to the hospital. There's a lot of issues going on, so uh, we're just going to be praying for 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 them and uh, to ensure that. Uh, that God um, has his will accomplished there and that they all be well. Um, okay, well, let's pray together then. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for the gift of prayer, for the opportunity to uh, give you our burdens. God, we pray that when we lay them down at your feet, that we would leave them there. So God, we're just going to start out by, by asking you to bless this school year. We're asking you to bless the teachers with grace and with patience, wisdom in the midst of all of this. God, we ask the same for the students. This year is totally different for them, and uh, they're going into something that is unfamiliar. So we pray that you give them patience and help them to be obedient, help them to be studious, Help them to put their best effort first, God. Lord, we lift up to you the sick. Now, now we ask that you bless Leslie and Pat. We lift up David to you, Lord. Ask for healing. And God, we don't want to forget those bus drivers that are going to be picking up children this year. We ask for safe passage to and from on their bus runs. Thank you, God, that you hear us when we pray. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. All right. So patience is what we are looking at today in the book of James, chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. And why is it that whenever anyone addresses you in the realm of patience, somehow the patience that you did have seems to fleet away and all that remains is frustration or irritation or worse. How dare you question my patience? I'm a patient person. Now, a long time ago when I was a child, that sounds silly, but uh, when I was a child, my parents wanted us to learn patience. And I don't remember, and I was asking Courtney and she doesn't remember either, if I did share that little special ditty with you that my family would teach us so that we could learn to be patient. And if I have, then I'm sorry you're going to have to endure it again, but uh, I thought I would share it with you this morning because I find it fitting. And they would say to me when I was impatient, be patient, be patient, don't be in such a hurry when you get impatient you only start to worry remember remember that god is patient too and think of all the other times that others wait on you okay i hated that song and it's funny because so does my son. <laughs> he hates that song. I don't even get through it all the way. Stop singing that song. Um, but getting back to the task at hand, James is going to show us today in three ways we are called to it. We are to practice it and we are shown people who have learned how to be it. And it 
is patient. Now, we started last week in, on verse 1, and verse 7 starts with a therefore. So let's go back together to 1 to find out the full context of what he is saying. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last day. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Therefore, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crops, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord is coming near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord's Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. James once again directs our attention to the imminent return of the Lord. The Lord is coming back. He said, I'm coming soon 2,000 years ago. He promised that He was coming back soon. Which helps us to posture our heart in that way. If we know that they're coming soon, we're going to be ready, right? If we have company coming and they say we'll be there soon, you make sure that the last dish is cleaned up and put away, that the floor has been vacuumed, that things are ready for them when they get there. Don't you? We get ready when we know that someone is coming soon. Jesus said, I am coming soon. James again says, He is coming soon. And not only is He coming soon, but He's standing at the door. Get your life in order. James cries out to us. Get your life in order. The rich thought they had their life in order. They've got all of their stuff, all of their wealth, and it's amassing and amassing, and the moths are destroying their fine linens, and the rust is corroding all of their precious metal. It's something that a thief could break in and steal. And Jesus has told us, don't lay your treasure up here on earth, but in heaven, where it cannot see any corruption. Where's your treasure? Sometimes we think our treasures will get us out of trouble. Or it will make trouble easier. Job in chapter 5, verse 7, made it very clear to us. He said, man is born to trouble. Man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. It's a fact. And so as Christians, we have to stop getting surprised by trouble. We've got to stop getting shocked that, oh my gosh, something terrible has happened to me or my family. Yeah, it's a certainty. Even Jesus told us, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have trouble in this world. But you take heart because I've overcome the world. When we start getting upset and we start getting shocked and we become impatient with people because there's trouble within us, we are showing that we are lacking heart. We've not taken a hold of Jesus' heart. We've set His aside and put ourselves out there and show our flesh off with a bad attitude 
a lack of patience, anger and malice, all of those things that have been told to us to be put away, they don't fit in the life of a believer. That silly song that I sang to you said, be patient. Don't be in such a hurry. As Christians, we're in the farming industry. I didn't know if you knew that. But we are. You see, we're to throw seed everywhere we go. What are you sowing? What is your life sowing around other people? Are you sowing goodness? Are you sowing mercy? Are you sowing joy? Or are you impatient? Are you sowing contempt? Are you sowing malice or division or anger? What are you sowing? What are you throwing out there? James gives us the beautiful illustration, and it's not meant to be metaphorical, it's literal. He says, look at the farmer. Look at the farmer. Look how patient he is. And in Israel, in the Middle East, there was a lot of patience because it only rained a few times there. James says he's patient for the early rain. The early rain would soften the arid ground and make it workable so that he could tend and put his crop down. And then he had to sit around and wait for the latter rains to come. Charles Spurgeon tells us this, A man to whom it is given to wait for a reward keeps up his courage. And when he has to wait, he says, It's no more than I expected. We don't like to wait, do we? But when we have courage, we can say it's no more than I expected. I never reckoned that I would slay my enemy at the first blow, and I never imagined that I was to capture a city as soon as I had, dig, as I had dug the first trench. I reckoned upon waiting, and now that it has come, I find that God gives me grace to fight on and wrestle on till the victory shall come, and patience saves a man from a great deal of haste and folly. You see, we're throwing seeds out. And we have to wait for the harvest. We don't want to be like the little kid who just can't wait and goes out and digs up what he did to see if it was growing just to kill it. We can do that. We can sow peace and then because of a lack of patience, destroy what we've sown. You see, the farmer waits. And he waits, working all the while. And he waits, depending on things out of his own power, with his eyes on the heavens, waiting for the rain to come. He waits with a reasonable hope of expectation of reward. He waits despite changing circumstances and many uncertainties. He waits encouraged by the value of the crop that he's sown. He waits encouraged by the harvest of others. He waits because he really has no other option. We can't make it grow. It does that all by itself. Miracle grow may help, but you know what I mean. He awaits the crop because he is aware how seasons work. We're in a season. Some of us may be in spring and some of us may be in summer. Some of us may be in the middle of a bitter winter. And it's cold. And it's dark. But spring follows winter. 
and summer follows spring. The sun will rise again. It's a promise. The cool thing about God is that He is a God of seasons and He can change your season. He can turn your winter into spring in the blink of an eye, in a moment of surrender. That farmer was aware in the midst of his waiting that one day, one day his crop would be ready and he would know that there was plenty more work to do. So that farmer didn't just sit around waiting doing nothing, did he? He had to prepare. He had to get his barns ready. He had to line up workers for the day. James says it, and I feel like I've said it over and over and over, and I've already said it this morning, but I'm going to say it again. Christ is coming back. His return is soon. Soon, if you look around at the evil, if you look around at the darkness this world is plunging itself into, laws being passed to murder innocent, Innocent babies, a minute from life outside the womb, is a sure sign that we, as a world or as a nation, I regret to say, have embraced the darkness. James warns us about this hardship that we face from day to day, the trouble that we talked about. And he said, don't grumble. Don't grumble against one another and then be condemned in your trial. Don't be one of those people who just complain, 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 complain. Oh, woe is me. It's bad for me. I'm not mocking you. I'm not lightening your pain and making fun of your pain. But what I am going to do is I'm going to aggrandize the name of Jesus in this place. And He is bigger than your pain. He's bigger than your situation. He's stronger than your foe. And remember, we do not battle against flesh and blood. But against spiritual forces. There are spiritual forces at work around us that want to do everything they can to get your eyes off of Jesus and onto your problems so that you stop glorifying God the Father and think about your issues. And while we think about our issues, we lose our patience with our spouse. We lose our patience with our children. We lose our, space, our patience with our neighbor. And we begin to grumble we begin to complain. James does a really cool thing here, how he talks about patience. Remember in chapter 1 how he said that we must be patient? That word is hupomone. Remember that word we learned in the Greek, which means to bear under? Well, he uses the word patient here, but he uses a different word. Macrothemeo. Macro, where we get the word big, right? But macrothemeo is speaking about being patient or long-suffering with people. You see, we have to not only be able to bear under the weight of the trial, but we also need to be able to bear under the weight of people's attitudes, people's disposition, People's lack of love in their life because of a lack of Jesus. Look, we struggle because we lack Jesus. I'm not questioning our salvation here. I'm just saying, more Jesus means more patience. Patience. 
Jesus comes as a judge this time. And He stands at the door. I heard the greatest story about a pastor this week. And he, in second grade, decided that he was going to show off in class. And so he decided that when the teacher left, he was going to get up and make a scene. And So he started jumping from desk to desk while she was away and having a great old time while she did it. While she was gone, he was having a blast and the kids were loving it. And he said, and I quote, but those orthopedic wedgies don't make much sound coming down the hallway. And she walked through the door and he was in mid-leap. His parents were called and his dad reminded him why that wasn't a good idea. And we can only imagine what that meant for that young man back in that day. It surely would have been a belt <laughs> or something else. Now, he says that. And he made that illustration, and I wanted to share that with you, because one, it's funny to think of what kids do. But of the reality that she was at the door, and he was not behaving the way he was supposed to be behaving. And he was punished for it. Jesus is standing at the door, awaiting His order to come back What are you doing? What am I doing right now in my life, with my life, for His kingdom or not for it? Those are our options. We're either with Him or against Him, remember? What does your life reflect? What does your heart reflect? Are you full of Jesus? This morning? Or is there something else that's warring for your attention? Is there something else that's more important than that love relationship that God is calling us to? Something more important than the King of the universe? Hang on, Jesus. Let me handle this. I'm going to be mad, or I'm going to be sad, or I'm going to be angry right now. I don't quite have time for your grace business. I've been there. I go there sometimes, but I don't stay there long. A little bit's too long. We stay there because of things that happen to us. We stay there because of what people have done to us or not done for us. And the only way for us to deal with that is to remember the assurance that God said, I am the judge. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. The wicked will get theirs. It's a promise. And not that we rejoice in the fact, you're naughty, so you're going to get it. No. It's the calm assurance that we understand that in Christ... Evil does not go unpunished. And a lot of times, that's that's our own wickedness that in heaven we forfeit reward of some kind because we chose wickedness over righteousness. And in those moments where we battle with those things or we endure those kind of things, listen to what David says in prayer. He says, Hear me, Lord, and answer me. For I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord. For I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord. For I put my trust in you. You, Lord, are forgiving and good. Abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. When I am in distress, I call to You because You answer me. 
Among the gods there is none like You, Lord. No deeds can compare with Yours. All the nations You have made will come and worship before You, Lord. They will bring glory to Your name. For You are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me Your ways, Lord, that I may rely on Your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear Your name. I will praise You, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify Your name forever, for great is Your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths, from the realm of the dead. Arrogant foes are attacking me, O God. Ruthless people are trying to kill me. They have no regard for You. But You, Lord, are compassionate and gracious, God. Slow to anger. Abounding in love and faithfulness. Turn to Me and have mercy on Me. Show Your strength in behalf of Your servant. Save Me because I serve You just as My mother did. Give Me a sign of Your your goodness that My enemies may see it and be put to shame. For You, Lord, have helped Me and comforted Me. Isn't that wonderful that David went the whole way around Beautiful doxologies of the grace and mercy and power of God. His own sinfulness. The sinfulness of others. And wraps it all up in a beautiful prayer that expounds upon the mercy and goodness and protection of God on those who love Him. That's our promise. That should be our prayer. Do wicked people try to do mean things to us? Yes, they do. They do. But God is our help. We don't need to be our help. We don't need to defend ourselves and bite back. Jesus never bit back. Why do we? So we come now to the moment of those who have been patient before us. But I need you to be patient with me because we're not going to get there this morning. We'll have to wait till next week. Okay? Patience. It's called a virtue. Patience is what is displayed toward us every day, all day, from God, by His grace. James wants us to know patience Like a farmer has patience, we must have patience. Paul tells us in Ephesians, be patient and bear with one another in love. It always comes back to love. God's love is amazing and great. His blood has washed us clean. Washed all our sins away. forgiven us to the uttermost so that we can learn how to forgive. How to be patient with others. Be patient. Don't be in such a hurry. Remember that God is patient too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You so much for Your Word. God, we're asking right now for another dose of patience. Holy Spirit, please, like a wellspring, come up from deep within us and overwhelm our hearts with Your patient love. Thank You, God, that You are long-suffering. Help us to be like You. Help us to remove any need that doesn't come from You. Help us to surrender to those areas, God, where we feel like we don't have to be patient with people. God, I don't think that any of us could imagine Jesus losing patience with people. Jesus, we want to look like You. and We want to talk like You talk.
Just ask that your loving arms would just wrap around us this morning and remind us of how loved we really are. God, for those of us who are enduring a cold winter right now, I pray that you would, by the light and power of your Holy Spirit, would flood that soul with warmth, the warmth of the awareness of your great, great love. Thank you that you're faithful, Lord. Even when we're not, you are faithful. Help us not to grumble against our brothers and sisters. Help us not to become unloving, but to constantly search for unity, constantly seek peace, constantly wait for the fruits of righteousness to burst forth from the ground and bear fruit. Jesus, we ask, as you have taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want us to remember that our offering jar is in the back. As you give today, please do give with a heart full of joy. If you've already given, uh, we're grateful as you continue to share in the ministry of this church. As we prepare to go today, would you please stand as we receive the blessing? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift the light of His countenance upon you and give you His peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, beloved.